front of this room. Sometimes I got nice small groups like this. This is a good size. You guys can actually see the instruments when I play them and not be in the distance back. Now before I start, I am curious, where are you guys from? Colombia. Colombia, very nice. Anyone else? I'll check New York. Very nice. Massachusetts, Maine, Pennsylvania. What part of Pennsylvania? Uh, near Philly. Very nice. My family's from Allentown. Oh, that's not exactly where. All right. Well, got a little bit of everyone from everywhere. Perfect. My name is Matthew, and I will be a music man this afternoon. First things first, I'm going to start with the history of this building, then the collection, then these fantastic instruments. So to start with, Henry Flagler was an entrepreneur in the 1800s. He made a little bit of money with a company called Standard Oil. His business partner was only John D. Rockefeller, and to say he's a little rich is an understatement. When Mr. Flagler passed away, he was only worth about $100 million. <laughs> or in today's money with inflation included, about $11 billion. So he was rich beyond his dreams. And at that time, it was fashionable. If you had money, you'd build your own train system. His friends built trains out to California and Colorado and Washington State. So Mr. Flagler joined in and built his train from Washington, D.C. south to Key West. Why go all the way out west when you can come south to this great state? And if you're going to use Mr. Flagler's trains, you're also going to use his hotels, too. Now the reason why I asked where you guys were from, how many of you are born and raised in Florida? We're alone. Yeah. <laughs> For everyone else here, you can thank Mr. Flagler for his invention. That snowbird. Come down in the winter time, enjoy our weather, go back up north in the spring. Basically, the Floridian tourism economy. Now, the first hotel built in the area was in 1885. That was the Hotel Constellion, right across the street. That's now Flagler College. And the book at that hotel, you had to be really, really, really rich. You had to know Mr. Flyzer to some degree, and you had a book for a minimum of three months at a time. <laughs> Even if you just want to spend a week there, minimum three months requirement for the season. And Mr. Flyzer quickly realized if you're going to use this hotel for the rich and famous and elite for three months at a time, you have to have something to do while you're here. So you built this hotel in 1887. This is the Hotel Alcazar. Again, the one across the street is for the really, really, really rich. This hotel was only for the really rich. <laughs> but, no matter which hotel you stayed at in the area, you, uh, and there were a bunch of time, you came here for all the entertainment stuff. The pool, spa, ballroom, bowling alley, bicycling, driving, tennis courts, archery, golf, everything took place here, and this was the place to see and be seen in its heyday. The place where the rich and famous would hustle and bustle with each other in the 1890s. If you wanted to meet anyone of any importance at the time, you came here in the winter. That is, until Mr. Flagler built his train down to West Palm Beach, built a hotel called The Breakers, and we lost all of our customers. Mm -hmm. And by 1931, the Great Depression finally killed us, and we closed up shop. Around that time, Mr. Otto Leitner was a magazine publisher in Chicago. He made a little bit of money on a magazine called Hobby Magazine, and he always told his readers to collect stuff. No matter what, always collect something. When the stock market crashed, Mr. Leitner didn't lose any money at all, but his neighbors all went broke. So to help them all out, he would go into everyone's homes and buy everything in their homes. Didn't matter what it was, he liked to buy anything. He had a mansion, he filled it up, bought the mansion right next door, filled that up too. He's a bit of a hoarder, guys, I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. Um, as you're walking around, on the second floor, there was a cape, and in that cape, there was 24 salt shakers. Kind of a cool little display, keep an eye out for it. I'd like to point that out because in storage we have 5,000 more. Just keep that in mind too. After two mansions and running out of space, Mr. Langner came down here in 1946 with health issues and he stayed at the Ponce de Leon Hotel, which was just an old hotel at the time. And across the street, he saw this building was for sale and he liked it. It was the right size for his collection, the same time period as his collection of the 1800s, and to be perfectly honest, it was a really good deal. This building cost $1.8 million to build in 1888. Mr. Leitner brought the entire structure for about $125,000, renovated it, and made a Leitner Museum in 1948, passed away in 1950. His last two requests was that this remain a museum forevermore. We've done that. And he buried with his collection. Out in the courtyard is Mr. Leitner's grave. On the way out, say hi for us, guys. <laughs> now, beyond collecting salt shakers and crystal, and even a shrunken head in the room next door, we got these fantastic instruments, which I get to play for you this afternoon. And how it works is I'm going to start with the youngest instrument, 
and play until I get to the oldest instrument last. And I will be moving around the room to do that, so feel free to move with me, guys, so you can actually see the instrument. So the first one I'm going to start with is this one right here. So come on over. From 1925, from the Western Electric Company, this is a Nickelodeon. Now these are popular in beer halls and ice cream parlors in the 1920s. By the 1930s, they were all but extinct for two reasons. The first is the Great Depression. When the Great Depression hit, people had to save their money. And at that time, a nickel to play this instrument was a lot of money. If you have to decide between food or music, this usually lost out. I'll tell you the main reason after I play the instrument, but first we get to hear it. It's a piano and a mandolin, so when you hear the instruments change, that's what they are. And it's a really simple machine. This engine down here will create a pneumatic vacuum. That vacuum will suck the air right where my finger's at. Paper rolling over it will get sucked in. Holes in the paper will let the air in, playing the instrument. So if any of you guys read music, this is where you read it from. Beyond that, let's have a good time. I'm expecting everyone to dance in here. <laughs> and enjoy. Regina vacuum cleaner. That's what they initially started as. So if you hear them, 
I don't really see how musical instruments and vacuums combine, mm -hmm. but that's Boy. just me. <laughs> <laughs> this is from about 1903. This is the Regina Corona. This is from about 1913. Now I'm going to play this little one here for you guys. Each disc is one song and one rotation is one playthrough. And it's really easy to swap the disc out for another one, if you so choose. Uh, the disc I have in this machine, though, is by an old guest from this hotel <coughs> who was a frequent visitor and always had a great time when he came to stay here. John Philip Sousa. Uh -huh. So we like to play his music in memory of him staying here so many times. <coughs> 1913. <coughs> Sousa was also known as the Marching King. He loved doing loud and bolsterous marching songs, and his most famous one is Stars and Stripes Forever. And as a result, he hated everything in this room. This is a loud marching song. You have a big band walking down the street playing lots of instruments. Wasn't it nice and cute and quaint on this little device? He thought these machines oversimplified and distorted how we heard the music and how we perceived it, and he felt that these machines ultimately simplified it too much and would basically destroy music for what we knew. So he hated everything in here with a tremendous amount of passion. So it's nice to play music on these machines. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> on a side note, um, John Philip Sousa actually never authorized his song to be turned into a disc. Someone stole his music and then made the disc out of it. <laughs> so all of his music is recorded on these machines, but he never authorized any of it. So, so much for copyrights, guys. This is the Regina Corona. At the moment, it's not working for a simple reason. When Regina made these great instruments and shipped them across the country, they forgot to ship one thing, mechanics. So when they broke, you could not fix their instruments. As is the case here, this piece is very fragile and there's one portion that's not working too well, so we're leaving it alone for the moment. On a side note, very si simple side note, because these machines were not able to be worked on very easily, the competitors ultimately got their foot in the door because their products could be fixed, which is how they ultimately beat them out of the market. Mm -hmm. How this machine works, though, is the disc comes up, it spins, and it goes right back down. It is an overly complicated vertical version of this little instrument I just played you guys and it sounds identical to it. So again, because of its fragile state, we play this little one here for you guys. This machine in 1903 would not have been found in a church or a bar. This would have been its own very wealthy and very elegant mansion. With these wonderfully colorful discs and the machinery behind this device, this d device would have been about $750 back then, which is a great deal of money. So the next instrument I'm gonna play for you guys is a little bit more modest in price. It's from the same time period as this, and just on the other side, we just gotta pop on over. You're good. You got it just fine. Don't worry. And you guys can come closer. I don't bite. The next instrument I get to play is this little one right here. This is the gem roller from 1904. Now these were popular in the 1890s and 1900s. And when they were first sold, these instruments were six dollars and ninety-five cents each, and each song was fifty cents. That's a lot cheaper than seven hundred and fifty dollars, but still more money than most people could afford. The Sears catalog changed all that. They loved the instrument so much they bought the company, lowered the price, featured it in their catalog, and made it three dollars and twenty-five cents oh with three free songs. Now suddenly, homes and businesses and churches could afford the instrument making it one of the most popular devices in the early 20th century. It's a harmonica in disguise. The accordion bell will go up and down, this cob will spin, and the different pegs will hit the different notes playing the instrument. And in the 1860s, a young man fell in love with a young woman in Canada, and to show his love, he wrote her a love poem. About a year or two later, she sadly passed away, but the poem remained very popular for decades and decades afterwards. 
when the Sears catalog first sold these instrument, instruments, they only sold hymns for churches. But the demand was so great for other things, they ultimately complied and started to sell love songs and pop music and poems like I have here today. The song is called When You and I Were Young, Maggie. And last but not least, the handle on this instrument came off many years ago, so the only way to play it is a pencil. <laughs> it seems a little silly, but it works great, so we just go with it. Enjoy, guys. <laughs> It plays great after all this time. $750. It's useless. <laughs> Go figure. The next instrument I get to play for you guys is this street piano right behind me. These are popular in the 1880s and 1890s, and they were first developed and created in England. And from England, they became popular in Italy. And from Italy, immigrants coming to the United States brought the knowledge and know-how of the street piano. It's a 48-key piano. It's basically what you just saw with that little roller. This roller will spin and the different pegs will hit the different notes playing the instrument. Just a little bigger. Now the only thing you have to remember about this device, this is a portable instrument. All you have to do is find a street corner you really like, rent this instrument for a day, <laughs> rent a car to carry the instrument, go over all the cobblestone streets to get to your street corner, <laughs> have someone quickly put it back in tune, have a couple of strong friends and rent yourself a little cob, and have your friends carry it. This thing weighs about 200 pounds, so good luck with that. And once it's in the machine, it is too heavy to move. You stay where you are for the rest of the day. Each cob has 10 songs on it, and you just cycle through the songs one after another, and the better you play them, the more tips you would get. And if you're lucky, you have a little monkey begging for the tips too. <laughs> it's the only instrument here you really have any control over the speed and tempo, so it takes a little practice to play, and it's always a lot of fun. It's always a little different every time you play it. So enjoy, you guys. <laughs> Work too. All the same basic principles of sound, just all dressed up in different ways. 
kind of a cool little, little way to show that off. And shameless self-promotion. Great gift in the gift shop, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> now, the last instrument I get to play for you is this one. And for those that came in late or late to hear it again, I'm going to play that Nickelodeon one more time after this, so stick around. This is the Orchestrian from the 1870s. And this is the first version of this instrument from Germany. When they updated this instrument later on, they made two small but important changes. The first is the book. This requires a cardboard book, and I will show you that book at the very, very end. That book runs out really quickly. So when they updated the instrument later on, they used a paper roll that kept going and going and going. The second thing is this has everything you can imagine inside of it. Drum, cymbal, glockenspiel, organ, piano, you name it, it's probably in here. If something broke, all you have to do is take the lid off. Take every single instrument and component out. Fix the one broken piece. Put everything back in. This instrument is a technological nightmare to try and take care of. So when they updated it later on, they made it round. And each compartment held a different piece of the instrument. That way if something broke, took the wood panel off the broken area, fixed it, and put the wood panel back. Making the later versions of the instrument really easy to use. And as a result, we still use this instrument today. Has anyone ever ridden on a merry-go-round or a carousel before? This is what plays at the center of it. It's an orchestra. Now, this instrument is old. It's from the 1870s. Not everything works perfectly well in here. In fact, it's going to sound pretty terrible. Not going <laughs> to lie. But it is still cool to see. When I turn it on, the book will roll through the instrument. So come on up to take a look at that. And again, afterwards, I will show you that book in closer detail. So for now, come on up, you guys, and enjoy. Okay. sleep at night and I dream. This is why I usually dream in the bathroom. It's actually a really simple machine. Underneath this device is a series of levers and when you turn the machine on, air pushes the levers up and the cardboard book simply pushes it all down and when there's a hole in the cardboard, the levers pop through playing the instrument. That sounds a little familiar to you guys. It's because it is. If anyone ever did any computer coding in the 60s and 70s, it's a punch card. That's all I'm holding. Now this book is not old, it is a replica of a book we have upstairs. This one's from the 1990s, and there's a little website on here to get another one. <coughs> to get another one, all you have to do is cut every single hole by hand. It takes six months to make this book right here. Oh. Now you would think for something that takes so long, they make it last forever, make it really sturdy. No they don't, it falls apart really quickly. <laughs> so we do our best to try and preserve these books and instruments so that we can play them for you guys. And on that note, it is fun to play these instruments. I always have a good time. I hope you guys did too. Thank you guys for coming out to the music demo. I am going to play that Nickelodeon one more time for you guys so that anyone that missed it get to hear it one more time. Oh, nice. You can put it on the stroller, that's fine. And two, let's get a Nickelodeon going guys. And enjoy. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 